Uh, hi, my name is Liron. I'm a, a business development manager at Starkware. Um, today's panel is going to be about uh, DeFi on StarkNet. Um, if you were in the previous panel, um, I think you, you heard a lot about like the production journey of like deploying an app on StarkNet, uh, learning Cairo, the migration to Cairo 1.0, the regenesis. A lot of that stuff might be uh, recovered, uh, recovered again in this panel, but I think with the more of it, we'll try and put more of a light on the like apps going into production in the DeFi space. Um, so on that note, let's do a bit of a um, introductions, maybe present who you are and the protocol that you're representing. We'll just go in uh, yeah. clockwise. So hello everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, Starkware session is uh, an awesome event, and I think it will be one to remember after many years uh, ahead. Uh, and also, it's a great pleasure for me to be in the same panel with Richard again. And of course, with this gentleman here, uh, with whom we have a collaboration. So, uh, my name is Aris. I'm a DevRel in Hashtag, where we build the ZK Native uh, money market uh, under collateralized lending protocol, uh, where we can uh, facilitate uh, loans of up to 3x your collateral and uh, without credit scores. Yeah. Hi guys, my name is Vitaly. I'm the co-founder and CTO at a company called ZKX. Uh, we've started uh, our protocol slash business slash trading platform a year and a half ago. You've probably seen my presentation a year ago, year, half a year ago uh, in Amsterdam. What we do, we uh, develop uh, a trading platform for perpetual swaps uh, with lots of complex trading instruments and financial instruments that you usually see in traditional industries. We've managed to bring it to perpetual swaps, which wasn't easy. We have another product, uh, which is the universal uh, bridge from L1 to L2 called Starkway. Um, lots of things, lots of developments we have team we were proud of and thank you very much for having me here it's an amazing event thank you very much guys and um shalom uh hey everyone uh, so i'm richard uh head of product at uh, nostra um and what is nostra so we are building the liquidity layer on starknet um, and liquidity layers comprised of three core products so one is no nostra money market where users can simply lend and borrow crypto um, the second is UNO, which is an over collateralized stablecoin, um, collateralized by ETH. And then the third is uh, Nostra Swap, which is a stablecoin DEX. And together, collectively, we call that uh, the liquidity layer. And we think that that's going to be the one stop shop DeFi solution for users that we can grow and scale with StarkNet. Yeah. Great. Um, so, in. I was just saying before the people coming in now, the previous chat panel talked about a lot that we wanted to cover. So I'm, I'm trying to focus more on the product side of, of DeFi on StarkNet. Uh, so maybe I'll throw out a few terms, get a bit of your opinions on this stuff. So uh, under collateralized lending, is that something that's possible on the blockchain? Uh, how are you planning to solve that? Uh, yes, of course it is. And uh, there are projects facilitating that, uh, like let's say Maple Finance but uh, they are focused uh, towards institutional players and they have a heavy KYC and uh, credit score checking. So uh, what we thought it's uh, the best way to facilitate that because as an idea it might seem okay easy and uh, it's been an ask for uh, quite some time now. Uh, so uh, how, we, how we, we built it is, um, and I will tell you with an example. Uh, so a user comes and uh, pledges, let's say, $100 as collateral, okay? And uh, let's also assume that uh, they, they choose to take the maximum as a loan, so $300, 3x. So uh, they have also the ability to withdraw off-chain almost instantly, up to 70% of their collateral. So from the $300 they took, they can take 70 back to do whatever they want with it. But the rest, 230, can be utilized as in-platform trading capital. So uh, these assets do not leave hashtag, but uh, in order for uh, them uh, to have the incentives initially, uh, we have uh, a 
credible dApps integrations so they can uh, go and trade them. Uh, for example, like ZKX or, uh, you know, uh, PancakeSwap, etc. So they can uh, have some significant gains. What's that? I, you won't like my answer. I, I do believe that it's not possible on DeFi. And the reason why is because DeFi comes in all types and flavors. If we say that anything that runs on blockchain is DeFi, then absolutely yes, it's possible. But if we really talk decentralized architecture, decentralized uh, organization that runs it, that nature remains that you won't be able to run KYC on your clients. You cannot have any sense information on your clients. And if we take DeFi to extreme, and I would argue that extreme that is now is something that we'll see as a normal DeFi few years from now, then it won't be possible. We will find a way to do unglorized assets. We'll find a way to do the risk appetite management, risk management in general. But as of today, if we talk about DeFi as anything that runs on blockchain, yes. However, if we talk DeFi in terms of truly decentralized finance, then I don't think it's possible. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I would also ag agree with that point, um, but I think there's solutions to it, um, which you know is 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 the road ahead. I think. Um, I think capital in inefficiency in DeFi is, is known. Like things can't be over collateralized forever. Um, that's not the world that we live in today. Um, so if we kind of want to retrofit the current sort of markets into crypto, um, we have a whole bunch of like leverage and like debt that is under collateralized by, by nature, by fractionalization. So I think um, the, the fact that people are like, it's anonymous, it's permissionless. Yes, there's no recourse to anyone, any bad actor taking a loan out and running away with the money and, and what have you, um, having a good time. Um, so I think when it comes to like, you know, online digital identities or blockchain identities, um, and soulbound sort of NFT wallets. I think that's probably not wallets, but NFTs attached and bounded to your wallet or your identity. I think that's where perhaps we can progress further into um, reducing the collateralization re requirements. Do you want to add something, Aris? Yeah, yeah, of course. So uh, I totally get uh, the skepticism from uh, from the guys here. But uh, first of all, uh, since the assets do not leave the ecosystem. Okay, so there's no, uh, 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 there's no way for the protocol to be in jeopardy in, at any time. Uh, and um, in, in um, the KYC uh, thing, I think the ZK proofs can help hugely towards that. So no sensitive data of people uh, will, be, you know, will be sent to either uh, us or any other uh, entity. And because uh, sooner or later, KYC will be kind of implemented, you know, from governance or, or uh, but with ZK proofs, I think uh, we can bypass that with uh, huge success. Literally, one thing to add, I think there is the difference between DeFi run by centralized organization that stands behind it and DeFi run by DeFi organization. And this will set the rules and structure for how it can be run. Hence the difference in, in approach, obviously. I tend to agree. My goal was to find something that the panelists would disagree on, and I think I succeeded, which is I'm happy with. Uh, the next the point on DeFi I wanted to pick up on, um, for those who've traded on DYDX or other stock instances, you're probably familiar with this, this idea of having an off-chain order book, or like, just for a bit of picture for those in the audience, uh, Uniswap on layer one Ethereum, you have these automated market makers, Liquidity providers are putting funds into a liquidity pool. They're not like putting in granularity. I want to buy at this price, sell at this price. Uh, what are your opinions on this whole uh, order book uh, architecture? I see the smile, Vitaly, um, uh, in the in this uh, in the DeFi world. Let's call it broadly. We'll thank thank you, Liron. Guys, so we have another forty minutes. <laughs> uh, I have things to say. That's true. So I don't know if you know we run the first and only decentralized order book, decentralized limit order book, um, which is partially on-chain and partially within, sits within our decentralized node network. Um, we always had a choice to go with AMM like, like lots of businesses do. But for us, the difference between running a good uh, balanced AMM and running a decentralized limit order book is 
level of control you can have over your trading. And this is especially important when you talk to very experienced traders, when you talk retail and when you, when you talk about very experienced institutional traders. The order book itself is the difficult tool to build. Um, decentralized limit order book is almost impossible to build. Uh, I don't know if there are any, any anyone here in the audience that know the complexities of that is behind the order book. But effectively, it's the speed of um, speed of matching, speed of execution, which can be achieved when you sit in the centralized environments. And there are very good protocols that do this uh, with the off-chain matching and computation and execution. But when you bring decentralized aspects into this, it becomes ten, ten times. Um, not difficult, but there are challenges that need to be resolved, and we've spent almost two years uh, solving these challenges. So obviously, I will always say that decentralized order book, or order book in general, is a better approach than AMM, simply by how much control you can have over your trading. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Vitaly on this, and uh, from I, I will I will answer from uh, the perspective of a trader. I used to be one initially, almost everyone probably <laughs> starts like this. Yeah. So uh, it is definitely an, impro an improvement uh, you know, in, in your um, uh, experience when you're trading you know, at the centralized, uh, in a decentralized environment, having order books, uh, no doubt, no doubt. I don't, I don't think anyone can disagree on that. So let's just play devil's advocate. How do you solve for challenges like uh, the market maker wants to cancel an order, but they're concerned that the validator might trade against that order instead of canceling it. It's not the it's not the problem of the timing of execution. It is the problem what you give as the time step for the execution. If you agree on super fast transaction on super fast closing of the order book, then it's it's not a technical issue. What we operate we operate uh, what we call a partial knowledge of the state which means that we have a massive, massive order book where we find the best price for your order, for your position uh, and for your order. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that we check all order book across the network because that would be impossible in terms of the closing in, uh, in, in certain amount of time. But as long as we can guarantee through the ZK that we find the best price for you within the tick of the system, then it, it works, and we've proved it works. And on top of everything, the TPS we have in our uh, test net is, again, I'm not naming any competitors, but we are roughly 10x to 20x in terms of the TPS of the, of the order book, which is decentralized. I, I cannot stress how proud I am of that. It is my baby, I know, but it's, it's what you can do now with the technology is amazing. Is that anything? Okay. The last thing on the on the DeFi side, and then, then we'll shift to the Starknet side. Um, maybe just like let's Ellie Benzasson talked about his mother a lot today. Let's pretend his mother's in the audience. Just to describe like the use case of a, of a typical user using your protocol. Why are they using the the protocol? What are they benefiting from? Um, yeah, like what what what, are, what what else would they be considering, and what are they benefiting from for using you? Um, so. With, with that in mind, so I remember like quite vividly 2009 uh, financial crisis. Um, uh, I don't know if anyone's from the UK, but like there was there was news going out there and people were lining outside banks trying to get their money, right? Um, doors were closed, um, typical kind of like bank run, but there wasn't enough money to give to, give, give to people. Um, and that's a centralized entity that everybody entrusted with their money. Um, their savings and um, they can't get, get access to it. And I think that's that's key and that's always stuck in my mind. And I've I've worked in traditional finance for like you know just uh, just under ten years. And um, you know it, it's the system that we we live in today. But I don't think that's the right thing for tomorrow. And I think um, having the ability to be your own sort of self sovereign self custody um, sort of you know, I guess guardian um, of your own assets is is key. Um, and, and I think right now it's lagging because of like the UX. Um, kind of, it's, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a hurdle for people to, to to understand. But I think the benefit is that the core benefit of DeFi, at least in my view, is that you have your own assets and you own your assets. 
um, you always have access, um, and nobody can sort of like revoke that away from you at any point in time. I think that more and more, like you know, as government censorship ha occurs and um, this, this sort of skepticism around centralization and central ent entities um, having control over your, you know, your life, your your crypto, your your your, your data, I think um, you know, DeFi is, is the answer in crypto in general. I literally cannot second this more. And the, the, the reason being, um, as the co-founder of the DeFi protocol, DeFi business, the, the question I hear most is, why DeFi? Well, realistically speaking, it's time to change the narrative here. And rather than saying, why DeFi, we should ask, you're doing centralized finance. Why? Why it's not DeFi? So rather than why DeFi, it has to change. And the reason for that is we've seen times and times how the centralized financial institutions fail. And it is inherently because of the structure of how they set up. So the moment when we change the narrative and we say that DeFi is your go-to way to set up a financial instrument, a financial company, an institution, I think we'll resolve lots of issues here. And the beauty of DeFi that, yes, it does have different flavors of we do it on blockchain, hence it's DeFi. Yes, it's still controlled by one account and one wallet. To the, to the state of it is truly DeFi, truly decentralized. If we'll stop saying that companies like <clears throat> free letters are DeFi, then we'll be in a better place to start with. So for me, it is change of the narrative from why DeFi to DeFi is the only true way to build a business that won't fail, to build a protocol that won't let you down. Yeah, for me, okay, uh, guys touched uh, the, the center core but uh, and I totally agree, of course. But uh, adding some one, two more points. Uh, first of all, uh, DeFi it's more fair. If we see the uh, the current uh, traditional finance uh, landscape, uh, you're basically getting uh, zero interest when you provide them liquidity. Uh, this is not the case in DeFi. Okay, it's uh, way more fair. Uh, secondly, uh, the, transaction fee, the transaction fees are uh, at the hundreds of times uh, less. And um, most of all, uh, you have that privacy thing uh, where you don't need to, to, <laughs> to bring out your life story and uh, sensitive data, which uh, in many cases we have seen that they, they can be touching uh, um, the point of fundamental human rights, okay? So they get aggregated and used in malicious ways. I think um, just uh, an, also another point that I just thought about is, you know, we're kind of moving our trust from humans to computers in a way um, and trying to build a trustless system, right? Um, and I think, you know, over time, we've seen many bad actors come uh, in human form <laughs> and, um, you know, rug pull people, right? Um, whether that's, yeah. Name, name your Ponzi, um, and and you know I think trying to abstract or remove that away, that risk, and, and move it into contracts um, is is is, a, is a sort of the way of tomorrow. Um, and then also you have like the, the the banks and the financial system and the amount of rent seeking that they have. Right, there's a there's a huge amount of like bonuses and and you know a huge amount of um, inefficiencies in that system. I think you know, as humans, we, we 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 look to improve on 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 things, and I think those are two two uh, sort of vectors to to look at. Absolutely, yes, and there is also a, a factor of integrity. There is a saying that integrity is when you do the right thing when no one's watching, and integrity in this sense implies trust. So if you work with organization or type of business or type of protocol where you have way to act, maybe in the way that is doesn't support integrity in how you deal with the client funds or uh, funds in general. If we build a system, if we build a narrative where you simply have no way to act in the way that is not kind of inherently, uh, in, inherently uh, trustless, doesn't require trust, then half the problems here will, will be resolved from, from the get-go. So integrity is important when you require it as the set up for the trust, but working in the environment where it's not required gives you way more freedom in a way how you work with, with your clients and the client funds and other businesses. 
was going to add, add to this. Um, <clears throat> most of my day job is talking about StarkX and selling it to businesses. Um, DYDX, as you know, is powered by StarkX. There are a few other exchanges and, and a few marketplaces powered by it. And uh, when you go on these like educational journeys with the customer, and they the, suddenly this like coin like it, it clicks inside them that like you can have this self custody while still being able to trade, um, and it's the same on these platforms as well. Um, and that's a very very powerful value proposition, um, and this is one of these things you only uh, appreciate when it's when it's threatened. You have funds on FTX, you'll never see them again probably. If you have funds on a, a DeFi protocol, there are smart contract risks, there are other risks, but at least this idea that on a theoretical level, you have self-custody while you're still able to trade. There's real value out there. Um, shifting gears, um, let's talk about StarkNet a bit. Um, so perhaps uh, maybe each, each of you can t talk a bit about your uh, Cairo journey, <laughs> um, uh, the ups and downs, um, maybe a bit more about the ups and the downs, um, the, 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 the journey towards mainnet together with StarkNet uh, itself, going through some uh, changes and upgrades and where you're at now. If there is one particular thing that I'm proud of is uh, that is coining the term Kozilek. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you guys remember or have seen my presentation from Amsterdam much last year, but I was talking about uh, how long it takes to bring new developers into Cairo. And I found the, the term Kozilek from, from Swedish that means kind of happy place. And at the time I said that it takes uh, two, week, two weeks to two months for, for a good developer to completely be onboarded to the system. And from that perspective, I think the timeline in this year and a half hasn't changed for us. What has changed is amount of things we can explain to a new developer that comes to the, to the engineering team. It still takes two weeks to two months, but the amount of things we can talk about, amount of tutorials, amount of hackathons we can show, amount of screencast is incomparable. It was an uphill battle even a year ago to explain what, how it works, uh, the, the, the intrinsics of, of zero knowledge, the, the Cairo itself, the StarkNet, especially when someone's coming from, uh, from, from Solidity. And we even found that it is easier to bring someone with very basic Solidity knowledge because the, the experienced Solidity developers are very set in their ways. Uh, but now things are, are different. Um, one of the issues for me as as the person who hires the engineering team in our business was how can I convince a developer to, to even join us because like Cairo? I mean, what's that? It's completely different now. Everyone knows what the Cairo is, everyone knows what the ZK is, and the amount of materials that are available is just staggering. And this is the biggest, biggest change I've seen in the last year and a half. Amazing. And this is all not just because of us, not because of this panel, but because of every developer that is working in the ecosystem. This is really, truly the best ecosystem in, in blockchain I've, I've seen in all my years. And I've seen a lot. It's brilliant. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'll come from a non-dev perspective, but I've got the, I've got the gospel from, from the, the, the team. So, um, I mean, we started um, developing Nostra I think in sort of May last year, um, and we've re recently launched our alpha on December. Quick show, sorry, um, but yeah, go and check it out. Um, so I think at the beginning it's fine. You know, the devs are pretty like like well stacked. You know, we've got a great team, um, and it took a, took a few weeks. But um, the, the, I think the only bugging issue for them was the testing. Um, I think testing was a bit of a pain. From what, for what I understand, and I think that majorly improved with um, Starknet Hard Hat plugin and Proto Star um, coming coming um, into the, into play as well. So, I think from that perspective, our development cycle and development timeline is like a lot more smoother. So, yeah. I have literally printed one of the slides from that presentation in Amsterdam that I put in my office that says debugging is the bane of my existence. Agreed, confirmed. Thank you. So uh, our journey started um, early last uh, summer, uh, where we started uh, digging a bit around uh, what StarkNet is and uh, what benefits uh, brings with it if we deploy. Uh, and uh, it was a no-brainer that uh, after uh, not so long that, okay, this is definitely 
uh, we will definitely uh, launch on Starknet and uh, we announced our um, strategic uh, partnership uh, around August. Um, the problems are more or less what uh, the guys said uh, here. So uh, when uh, as a developer you're used to work in solidity and uh, you feel this is the norm, okay, and this goes to every sector, not only blockchain, uh, it, it kind of feels strange, you know, to, uh, to migrate to the, and learn something else. Uh, and it, it comes with a skepticism also, okay, will I be good at this, uh, what problems will I face, etc. But uh, if you are a good dev, uh, then yes, uh, you can adapt and uh, the two month period is uh, uh, how long it took us to, uh, to adapt and to be at a very decent level. Uh, okay, Cairo has um, the challenges that uh, it's a language that uh, continuously evolves. So once you feel you conquered something, uh, then something <laughs> new, a new update comes out and you have to go back to school. Um, but I think now with uh, the Cairo 1.0, uh, we will have uh, quite of uh, a different scenario and uh, a more stable framework where uh, all these things will be you know, scaled down. Did you want there is also one additional trend that I think worth mentioning. Uh, my background is initially in traditional software engineering. Uh, I'm in the field of software engineering for the last 25 years. Uh, what I've seen even five years ago in, in the blockchain industry is the protocols and projects working in the blockchain industry do not apply same way of development and engineering as you would see in the normal businesses. What I mean is uh, proper sprints, uh, quality assurance, test coverage, ability to run normal tools for, for linting and for, for uh, debugging. Now it's started to change. I, I talked to uh, a lot of different protocols and things have changed now. The type of approach you have in engineering in Cairo in, and in, in, in blockchain in general becomes similar to traditional approach where quality is the paramount. It, it hasn't been like that. even. Uh, two, three years ago. Now you talk to other protocols, uh, other engineers, and quality of the code is the paramount now. That's that's massive change. I'll just say uh, anecdotal on my side. Uh, so many teams who come to us and say, oh, but you're not in Solidity. What, often what they're saying between the lines is, well, we wanted to fork Unisop V2 and not do any work ourselves, but now we're not able to because you're not in Solidity, you're in Cairo. So being forced to write uh, in a new language and actually do some hard work yourself really builds a fantastic organic community. And I think uh, like one proof of this is having protocols like you on the stage and not having um, L1 apps that are just being redeployed on another EVM chain without actually any, any new work being done. Um, the, uh, the, other thing, the other big difference with Cairo facility is, is really the tooling. Uh, you mentioned Protostar, but then Cairo gets an upgrade and Protostar is two months late with the release. Um, Th that, that, that is something that just takes time, but like you're saying, the, more, the traditional world also has migrations to new code bases frequently, and uh, good engineers just o overcome that hump. We have one minute left. Um, any questions from the audience? I don't see any hands, so I will, I will ask on behalf of the audience. Oh, there, we got one guy. That, that is a superb question. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, one thing that we didn't mention here is TPS is good. Scalability is awesome. Low cost, brilliant. The thing that I love most in, in StarkNet is account abstraction. 
this is really game changer for us and for any other DeFi protocol. The ability to run uh, account abstraction in StackNet is initially, I'm not kidding, the best thing after sliced bread. So if we talk about two things that we enjoy, TPS, obviously, we, we have business to run, so we, we need to have lower costs, but account abstraction and what you can do with it. But we have to end there. <laughs> um, otherwise, Brilliant question, though, so thank you. Um, so we'll just wrap up here. Thank you to Aris, to Vitaly, to Richard. Uh, you're welcome to come up and ask questions, but let's clear. We're going to clear this floor so the next uh, presentation can come up. Thank you very much, Leon. Thank, thank you, you very much. It was, it was a Thank you. Time.